it can seem pointless because maybe the person didn't change their mind on the spot or even the second time you've talked to them. Often those points will land with them and they'll reflect on them later. Or if there is an audience, other people will think about what you've said and maybe change their minds. So I'd encourage people to keep engaging regardless of how difficult it is. For you as a documentary filmmaker, what are advantages in that medium to get a message across to people? The advantage that comes to mind most easily is that you can be really direct and sort of on the nose. You can talk about the, the things that you're really interested in without having to couch it in some fictional landscape. Um, and, you, and you can just directly explore ideas. Um, so that's nice. I've done some fiction in the past, but um, I really feel like I've found my stride a little bit more more and a little bit better with documentaries. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's where I've been focusing the last few years. Yeah. And how, how did you get into that in the first place? I started filming some events for Peter Bogosian at PSU, Portland State University, probably back in 2016, 2017, something like that. And then when Trump was elected, I had this idea of trying to understand and document the problem and then offer potential solutions. Um, so I started reading like, Jonathan Haidt and and uh, looking for people who were having those conversations, like Daryl Davis, who goes out and is a black man and he talks to the KKK members and gets them to leave the Klan. And there's a great film called Accidental Courtesy that he's he's in. Um, so I just started finding all these people that were interested in kind of the same thing, and I just wanted to turn turn that project into a film and see if I could offer some help for people. Mm-hmm. So that's ultimately how I got into it. Yeah. What did you pick up from Jonathan Hyde? I'm, I'm curious. I, I personally, I just saw him speak at, uh, at a university around here in Los Angeles recently. And it was fantastic. Oh, nice. Yeah, I really like his work. Um, he's touched on a number of different things. He started by studying morality, and in, in, in particular, disgust and how that relates to morality. But he wrote a book called The Righteous Mind, I think, in 2012. And I read it probably in 2016, 2015 or something like that. Um, I think that's when it came out. And I just really found his moral foundations theory to be pretty fascinating. So he just talks about the the moral intuitions that we all have that that gear us to to vote and um, you know speak and act in particular ways. And he says that conservatives have a different set of moral intuitions, essentially that guide their behavior than liberals do. And he tries to map that out onto things like five or six different. Um, foundations, moral foundations. And so that, that just really intrigued me and seemed to have, to be a good explanation as to why we're so different politically. And I think he's right. I think there are other, there are others like George Lakoff who've talked about moral politics. And I think that's the right way to think about it is that morality is really what drives our, our politics and what drives our voting decisions and all of that. So that's really kind of what I picked up from, from Hype. And now that you've gotten into documentary filmmaking, how do you feel about what seems to be the rise of, of documentary films? It seems with streaming services and stuff, we're getting much more exposure to that. Are we in a golden age or is it uh, watered down? Especially since COVID, I think, you know, that gave a lot of people opportunity to make more documentaries. That's easier than getting a bunch of people in a room to make a you know, fictional narrative. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. You know, there are so many... I'll say in terms of the indie film world, there are so many different film festivals, <clears throat> many of which are just online, that they're often just sort of a sham. So if you, you get you get tons of filmmakers just pumping out content and trying to make it into these film festivals. And so it can be watered down to to a, a degree, but it's, a, it's also great that you know the technology is much more affordable. People can tell stories a lot more easily. Um, so it opens the doors for a lot more people to be able to be involved and, and tell interesting stories, I think. And you said that with a documentary film, you can be more on the nose. Uh, what do you think can be done in documentary film to, to get an idea across directly, but also to promote thought and uh, a critical approach as well? I do think it's key to make it emotionally engaging because otherwise people are going to just tune out and not really be interested. I mean, there are some of us who like abstract thought and who like thinking anal- anal- analytically and like films like that or like books like that. But most people, I think, are looking for something entertaining and engaging. So that's been one of my focuses on When in Doubt, my um, upcoming film, is to try to try to make the stories interesting enough so that people will then pay attention to, oh, 
what are some techniques that I can use in this conversation or you know, what aspect of this story impacted me where I can take that and use it in my life. Um, so that's, that's less on like the practical of how to have those conversations, um, but it's more, I was focusing more on, on just what gets people interested in the first place. Mm -hmm. And how do you keep yourself on point with that and making sure that you're, um, getting at the truth and, and not, um, just sort of pushing, uh, propaganda or something like that, that you, how do you kind of check yourself? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think just I, I, certainly I have my own biases. I'm human. It's impossible to avoid. But, um, you know, I think having an orientation toward searching for the truth and also in the title is doubt. And so that's really key for me. So um, I'm trying to show doubt as, as often a virtue. It's, it's often not looked at as a virtue. Um, but I think that's one way that people can kind of check themselves and ask, Okay, is this conclusion that I've come to about political polarization or about morality or about why people are not speaking to each other, is it is it the right one? And um, you know, have I left room to doubt my own conclusions? And I think that's just really key. I, you know, it's when people start saying they're 100% certain about anything um, or most things, uh, it it can be problematic. So I, I think that just allowing some doubt into our conclusions is wise um it's not wise if you you know doubt the fact that you need to eat or save your child from running in front of a car but when it comes to philosophical issues and most political issues i think allowing some doubt and really having doubt be be a vehicle to learn more and to realize that i could be wrong about something is is key yeah you, you said doubt as a virtue I think that's a tough one to swallow. I used to be a naval officer, and you know, in the military sense, if, if you have certainty, people will get behind you. I have sure. friends who are surgeons, and they say the same thing that in you know in in the operating room, if you are certain, then people just jump in, whether or not you're right. Um, sure. So, how do you destigmatize doubt? Yeah, well, in those two contexts, it, it's probably good often to, to be certain, I mean, it's, it's not good if you're operating in the wrong place or, <laughs> or making a military strike that proves to be disastrous. But um, so even in those situations, some doubt is warranted. Um, but yeah, I mean, you see that also with political leaders and, mm -hmm. and thought leaders, people that are very certain and speak with a kind of bravado and, and certainty and confidence are, are the people who, who are going to get more people behind them because that's just a natural human tendency. I think we like to look to people who know what they're talking about or who seem to know what they're talking about, who will give us answers. And I don't, I don't know that that will ever change. I, I doubt that that will ever change. It's probably just an inbuilt part of our psyche. But I think encouraging some skepticism and encouraging some, um, you know, hit, hitting the pause button and analyzing what people are saying, even if they do sound very confident, even if they seem to have the facts on their side, I'm wearing a Thomas Sowell shirt that just says, show me the evidence. I really <laughs> love Thomas Sowell, um, but I don't agree with everything he says. And I try, I mean, Sowell always marshals a lot of facts and evidence for his conclusions. But, you know, I, it's even in, in that case, it's good to to say, OK, well, where where could he be wrong? You know, and, and what could he be potentially getting wrong? Um, so I just. Yeah, I think I think it's ultimately a better position to take, especially for making um, important decisions about our own lives and about other people's lives, to not be so certain and just ignore, contra, you know, counter evidence or contradictory statements that come back at us. I think it's important to 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 be um, yeah to, to have a certain sense of doubt that I think can can be healthier for us. Mm -hmm. And you, you said encouraging doubt. I wonder maybe in your process of of making this film, um, what have you seen that works for that? Is it does it come from a leader? It, or does it come from uh, some sort of practice within an organization? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think it has to come from introspection. I don't think that it can necessarily come from someone. In, in other words, I don't think people can foist it on some on other people. But if you can at least show why doubt is important, I like to refer to this story. I, I forget where it was, but. I remember, I remember hearing about this Islamic extremist who was obviously 100% certain that Islam was correct and he was going to, I think he had like a truck bomb or something and he was going to blow some people up for his cause. Well, 
you only do that if you were 100% certain that's the right thing to do, right? And apparently he was, it was delayed, he was delayed for some reason. It was like Googling contradictions in the Quran for whatever reason. And something he read caused him to doubt a little bit, right? But enough to abandon the project and not go kill a bunch of people. So I think, you know, stories like that and instances like that can illustrate the importance of doubt and why that's necessary. I mean, it can be the same with, with any other religion or political philosophy uh, or, or way of thinking. If we can just show the necessity and the importance of having some doubt or uh, questioning ourselves to some degree, then I think that that can sort of trickle out and people can then see, especially if it's you know, wrapped in an engaging story, see why doubt is a crucial thing. Mm -hmm. And your story gets to something that maybe makes all this a little bit tricky, and that's that it seems we have kind of a vacuum of religion and meaning in our current culture. Um, what do you think has been the, the impact of that as far as uh, polarization that you've seen? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a huge question, and there are a lot of people that talk about that at length, like Jordan Peterson and many others. But um, yeah, I think it, it it has led to some degree to people t uh, glomming on to other quasi-religious movements, whether that's wokeness or QAnon or you know other other ones that are out there. But um, yeah, I think it's both interesting and unfortunate at the same time. It's it's interesting because it there's a certain kind of freedom that you can have from religious dogma and from some of these past ideological traditions that are often harmful, where they, they bring in harmful ideas or beliefs. But at the same time, they were unifying and they gave people meaning and they gave people direction in their lives. So I have, a, I have mixed feelings about um, the decline of traditional religion. But yeah, ultimately, it can obviously lead people to people who want that sense of meaning in their lives and want to look to a higher power another source for their meaning um they might not be as introspective and they might just latch on to you know, whatever popular movement is out there now and that may lead them astray so to speak that may cause them to do things that they would otherwise not do um if they were being more reasonable <laughs> yeah. and uh, not looking for meaning in an unhealthy or negative sense mm -hmm. and in researching you i saw that you've had a transition kind of out of a, a religious group uh, what is that search for meaning been like for you? Yeah, it was certainly a central piece to my life, especially in my late teens and early 20s, um, because I, I I grew up in a very conservative, very fundamentalist Christian home, and uh, eventually a lot of the beliefs and a lot of what I was reading in the Bible just didn't sit well with me morally. Um, it wasn't really about it being empirically wrong at that point. It just didn't, it just didn't feel right, and eventually I just slowly left it behind. And when I completely lost my faith, there was a combination of things that happened, but I became very depressed and very suicidal because my whole world just shattered. And, you know, I didn't really have any direction in life. I didn't have any sense of meaning. I also lost a community for, for a while because the community I grew up in was very religious and I was all of a sudden not. Um, so it was a huge deal and getting out of that um, was really challenging. And it took a lot of, you know, I, I started reading philosophy and other spiritual traditions, you know, Buddhism and Taoism, various things like that. And that opened up the world for me to realize that the, there are other ways of, of, of deriving meaning from life. And ultimately, I came to more of a, a very personal sense of what meaning is or, in my view, should be for, for everyone. Um, but the, the key components are you do need a community. We're not, you know... Um, no man is an island unto himself, as it's said, and um, so that's that's key. And then engaging in something purposeful or meaningful in one's life, I think, is also just really important. Um, and for me, that's the the type of work that I do, trying to help people think a little bit more critically and a, and a little bit more cautiously about what they believe, and be a little bit less credulous and a little bit less dogmatic. So that's really kind of where I found my sense of meaning after I lost my my religion. Mm -hmm. What did you do about the community aspect? I mean, that seems tough. And, and the last couple of years, too, so many things have been uh, shut down. What was that like? I've had some ups and downs as far as that goes, for sure. Um, you know, I've, I've since been able to communicate better with my family and some of the people I've grown up with, but still not necessarily that close with a lot of them. 
So I, you know, I moved to, to out of where I used to live in a small town in Washington to Portland ultimately, and um, you know, I found community in in a group of martial artists, and that was it was sort of like my my church <laughs> in a sense. Um, and then from there, just um, you know, in the filmmaking community and other people that I've become close with who also have similar goals that that I, to, to mine in terms of making these kinds of films and that sort of thing. So I found community in. A, a variety of different ways and then of course COVID made it more difficult but even before that I had a debilitating back pain issue and so I was already kind of un unintentionally self-isolating I had to live in my bed for four and a half years so that cut off a huge source of interaction with you know my martial arts community and and everyone else but thankfully I had, I had developed so many good friendships that people you know were really helpful and and so i had a lot of friends that would get me groceries or do things for me or take me um, places so that community aspect really came through for me when i was suffering through that that painful uh few years um so again it's it's a it's crucial wow wow that's that's really cool that uh that you had something like that i mean yeah I think a lot of people especially during that time uh, did not so that, that shows a real depth to the relationships that you can make in these environments yeah, yeah, and the importance for sure. Yeah, I was just talking with someone a couple of weeks ago. He said something about martial arts, something like, "You know a guy differently when he's tried to choke you." <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's a different kind of bond. Yeah, definitely. A quote from uh, that gentleman you mentioned earlier, Daryl Davis. He said, "Missed opportunity for dialogue is a missed opportunity for conflict resolution." What do you think he meant by that? I think it's similar to something that Sam Harris has said, which is we have conversation or we have force or violence. Um, those are kind of the two options that we have to make things happen in the world. And I think most of us would prefer the former. We prefer conversation. And if we're not allowing conversation or not engaging in conversation, um, then we're not we're not resolving conflicts. And so I think it's I think what Daryl meant by that is conversation gives us an opportunity to engage in dialogue and figure out why a person believes what they believe, why I believe what I believe, and to come to either some kind of compromise or some understanding at least, and ideally create friendships, help get things done. Because again, if we're not, if we're not having productive dialogue, then we're just, you know, insulting each other or using force to force other people to do what we want. Um, and that is in so many ways problematic. <laughs> yeah. What's that looked like for you? Have you um, had experiences where you feel like you've, you've done this or you've seen someone do this well? Um, yeah, I would, I would say first off, um, it almost never works well on the internet. <laughs> and, you know, and I've engaged in some playful back and forth myself uh, when people come and just tear me down or insult me for no reason. Um, you know, I, I usually kind of jab at them a little bit, but uh, that's largely because I don't take those interactions seriously, and I don't think that that's really a good way to have these conversations. I think the best way is in person or one on one. Um, and yeah, I've you know I was with Peter Bogosian at uh, PSU, I think it was in May, and we were going around the country having these conversations with students about various social justice issues. And we kind of got mobbed by a group of like 19 social workers outside of PSU. And they just wanted, wanted to disrupt, they kept using that word, what we were doing. They said we were causing harm by doing this thought experiment game um, where we would just put a claim on a board. The claim happened to be there are only two genders. And then we'd ask students whether or not they agree or disagree and just ask them questions about why they believe what they believe and what, what would get them to change their mind, regardless of where their opinion happened to be. And just as a result of doing that, they came down and just told us we were causing all this harm and doing all this damage to people. And, and there's a great video out there that we filmed of Peter handling that confrontation. I think he handled it really well. I think he probably handled it better than I would have. Um, it definitely felt similar to what I had grown up with, which with a bunch of self-righteous religious people coming and telling me what I needed to believe or I was going to burn in hell. Um, but you know that was a, that was a really tricky situation because it seemed to me that they didn't they didn't necessarily want to have a productive conversation, but it didn't end in blows. No one got hurt. Nothing nothing bad really happened. He gave them all a chance to speak and, and did a really good job of of allowing each person to get off their chest what they needed to get off their chest. And then it ended. 
and everything was fine. So that that was just, a, I think, a good example of, of something that I was in personally where, uh, again, I think he handled that well. He, I don't know if he, he changed anyone's mind in that situation, in that scenario, but um, I don't think that they really wanted to have that kind of conversation. So really, it, you know, in order to have a more productive conversation, both parties need to be willing to change their own minds. That's where that that doubt comes in, right? If, if you're not willing to change your, your mind, then you're really just sort of preaching at somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that bit about what would it take to to get you to change your mind? Um, people have to have an answer to that, it seems to if you're going to get somewhere, you know, some, some people don't. <laughs> right. What, what kind of answers do people say? What are, what are the things that would even uh, trigger that in others? Well, if we're talking specifically about the, the university tour that we did, we had so many ver various claims that I couldn't really recount, you know, the specific details on what would get them to change their mind. But some people would come up with various kinds of evidence and they would say, well, I would need to see X, Y, and Z in order for me to not agree with this position anymore or to, to agree, agree with it. So it really, it really depends on the claim and it depends on, on the proposition that's being discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just spoke with uh, Sebastian Younger, who's a, who's a writer and a documentary filmmaker. Yeah, he's And great. Um, he, had a, he had a near-death experience uh, right. where he, he says he saw his father kind of getting pulled into like a black tunnel or a pit. Um, and he said it, it made him question his ideas about death and an afterlife and being an atheist. Um, but when, when we kind of got into, well, what, what would make you change your mind? Um, he was still looking for data or something like that. It, I think that makes sense. I know a lot of atheists have been asked, you know, well, what would change your mind in terms of, um, you then believing in a God, whereas now you don't. Um, it seems like a lot of people have trouble answering that, which seems odd to me because I, I can answer it pretty easily, which is if God showed up to everyone and said, here, record this with whatever device you want and just had the same message for everyone, <laughs> I think that would be pretty convincing. And then we'd have not only the subjective experience, but we'd have the recordings of everyone's cell phones and, you know, recording devices. Um, so I think that would be, a pretty, that would convince me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's kind of funny. So you, you've, you've really, you've engaged with these ideas, particularly in Christianity, um, and the Bible is a, is a recorded device. So what was the rub for you with that? Oh, that's, that's a big question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, calling it a recorded device is interesting um, because certainly much of it seems to have just been fabricated out of whole cloth. Um, but if, if even if we take, the, yeah, so I, yeah, I guess I have an issue with that um, framing. But, uh, you know, ultimately, like I said, there were, there were aspects, especially to the Old Testament, that just made me feel like, I'm not sure that this is a God that I feel comfortable worshiping or that I really think is really all that loving. If he's commanding the Israelites to go slaughter people <laughs> and make the versions for themselves, which is in the Bible where God is literally condoning, or at least the prophets are saying that God is condoning rape. Um, so there were things like that that just did not sit well with me at all. And then I started analyzing the new Testament a little bit differently and, and reading some of the, um, you know, original translations of some of the words, like, for instance, hell, like Jesus is the one that introduced hell as this place of eternal torment. It didn't really mean that in the Old Testament. It meant it was usually Sheol, a place of where the dead go to rest or an abode of the dead. So it just meant where you where you died and, and rested, essentially, not somewhere where you were eternally suffering. And so there were there were just um, there's just I guess there's a litany of things that made me morally uncomfortable and emotionally uncomfortable with using this as a framework um, for understanding reality and, and, and morality. And, and then, uh, you know, then I was just relieved later to discover the idea of empiricism and that none of this really had any empirical grounding whatsoever. So I really didn't need to worry about it. Um, so that's, I guess there's two, two main reasons the the moral discomfort that I had the emotional discomfort and then, the lack of empirical data to mm -hmm. this. So. Mm -hmm. What what got you to do that that extra layer of searching? And you were probably familiar with the Bible before that. The extra layer uh, around empiricism, or yeah, and and the, the things that brought the the conflicts to mind for you, in, in maybe a way that you hadn't um, necessarily been affected by them before. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can't say why at you know 12 or 13 years old I was thinking about these things and why they bothered me. I guess I, I think that we all have our own innate sense of morality that's evolutionarily developed, and um, there was something in there that just didn't sit right with me when I was reading some of these passages and reflecting on it a little bit more on my own, uh, rather rather than just being preached to or you know having the gospel shared to me at at church or whatever, when I would read these stories myself, I would think, well, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm told that God is really loving, but yet he's condoning killing all these people. It, it just didn't really sit well with me. Um, and again, I don't know exactly why I have those intuitions or why I had those intuitions, but I, I did. Um, and in terms of the more empirical view, I started reading you know, like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and and then learning more about just the scientific method and reason and rationality and and just um, learning that, you know, again, there's there's no real empirical evidence for these things. So um, it just stopped worrying me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in, in your work with your documentaries and things, how have you seen people's politics play out like religion? I've particularly seen that in Portland, um, just given that Portland is is kind of the woke capital of the world and it's very left leaning um, or progressive. Uh, I always thought of myself as a liberal and um, especially once I left behind my religion. But I just started to notice a lot of similarities to the things that I grew up with in in the public sphere, whether it was on Facebook or in person talking with some of my Portland friends. I would see a lot of the same kind of dogmatic in-group, out-group thinking, well, if these Republicans or people on the right don't agree with us, well, they're, they're bad, they're evil. You know, maybe they're not going to hell, they're not going to burn forever because we don't have that belief, but, but they're bigots, you know, or they're Nazis or whatever the, the phrase is. Even though I could see, well, no, they're clearly not. They just don't agree with you <laughs> on X, Y, or Z. And it doesn't mean that they're horrible people. So to me, I mean, maybe it's not right to call that religious, but to me, it really reflected the kind of religious dogmatism that I had grown up with. Um, but where it does venture into religion, th there is a kind of, almost a kind of faith in some of these woke beliefs um, where people don't necessarily have empirical data for what they believe. They, they have their lived experience, right? Or they have... Um, what other people have told them and they don't necessarily need to run a background check and figure out whether or not this is actually true because it appeals to some intuition or sort of some moral intuition for them. And then, you know, many people have laid out the similarities in particular with wokeness, but you could also talk about QAnon and sort of like the tr more diehard Trump cult type people. Um, you know, there's, there's just, there are a lot of similarities. Um, we could do a whole show just on that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you put uh, lived experience in, in air quotes. Um, what is, uh, what is the, the framing there around lived experience? Well, I, I don't see the, the need for that term. I think that that term has been manufactured to give more impetus to anecdotal subjective experience than is necessary. And, that isn't, and I'm not downplaying the importance of, of personal experience of having these experiences. Um, but the word lived makes it sound, it makes it sound a lot, um, like it, like it has a lot more going for it than it actually does. And it's kind of, it's redundant. I mean, every experience is lived, whether it's personal or collective. Um, so it's just, it's kind of an odd phrase and I just don't, I don't ever use it myself when just describing what I've been through, what other people have been through. So it just, it seems to me to be a, both redundant and unnecessary. If we're comparing these sort of political movements to a religion, you had your experience of questioning things and then eventually um, stepping out of your religion. Uh, what do you think can connect with people that might make them question these um, intense political movements? I think showing the more extreme elements <clears throat> and where those extreme elements can lead um, might get people to push pause and reflect a little bit more. Um, and I'm just talking about, you know, when a person, again, believes, is 100% con convinced of their belief, what will that lead them to do? And then we can show examples of what that has led people to do, whether it's, you know, be, can do a, a suicide bombing or kill an abortion doctor or w whatever it is. Um, so that's, that's 
one way. I think the other is if if we can get people to be interested in, which is really challenging, but get people interested in epistemology, reflecting on how they know what they know, why why they believe what they believe. Uh, they, they can be really interesting for people. And, and I find with most people, not everyone, but most people, when you start down that path, they, they are interested in it. It's, it's kind of exhilarating. Like it's, it's really interesting because no one's asked them about how they arrive at their conclusions or why they believe what they believe because we're so used to just these talking points and talking past each other and just sort of spitting out um, recited facts or points for our side that you know when we actually deconstruct some of these conversations and really reflect on why we believe what, what why we believe what we, we believe it can be really interesting for people mm-hmm. is there a a boundary in terms of maturity that people need to even be able to do that reflection like you said you, you work with peter bizagosian that you've been around younger people you know early college age um do, do you see a, an age breakdown there probably is but i wouldn't want to like spell it out explicitly because i'm not really sure i mean like i said i was, I was 12 or 13 when i was <laughs> reflecting on these things so but maybe i'm weird maybe i'm unusual um but you know i i have discussions like this with my nephew, who I think just turned 20, um, you know, so I, I don't, I don't know what the age range is. Obviously it's a, it's hard to have these conversations with somebody maybe below 10 or something. Um, but obviously somebody has to be interested in it. And, you know, practically speaking, of course, a person has to have a certain level of IQ in order to have these conversations. But, um, again, I don't know where the delineation is exactly there. What could this conversation look like if, if somebody wants to, wants to start, um, questioning something like that? I mean, I live in Los Angeles. There's certainly a dominant political narrative here. Um, you know, if, if people are just out at the bar and then they want to get into some of these ideas or maybe somebody brings something up, what can that look like? What can be done to make it effective? First thing that comes to mind is, is our, always our natural tendency, and it's my natural tendency too, which is to bring up counterpoints and counter facts, right? Mm-hmm. It's to immediately marshal evidence for our position. Um, but that usually just shuts people down and then they'll just lob their own facts at us. And so, again, it's really more about asking questions and the importance of, of, of that. Uh, so start, starting with questions like, okay, well, why do you believe that? So if someone makes a claim at a bar and you're having a conversation, maybe, maybe you don't agree with that claim, rather than just saying, well, that's bullshit, that's, that's not a good way to start, <laughs> or, or here's why you're wrong, ask them, ask them if, they, if they ever thought about whether or not they could be wrong, right? Like that, that's a much better way to ease into the conversation. And sometimes people, people's guards will go up then, but uh, a lot of times they won't. Um, and you know, that's something that Daryl Davis talked a lot about when I was interviewing him is, is keeping people's walls down because the idea is to plant a seed. Or he talked about planting a seed of doubt. And again, it happens from asking questions, asking people why they believe what they believe, asking, asking them what would get them to change their mind for instance, you know, and, and that's a really interesting thought exercise. Um, and so there, and there's a number of tools to do that in, in a number of books, but uh, for when in doubt, I'm largely using Pete's book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, where they outline a whole host of, of tools. So for people who want to know more, they can read that. There's also Nonviolent Communication is a great book um, where you're, you're focusing on what, what are people's underlying needs in the conversation. Um, so you actually going a little bit deeper and talking about their emotional needs and why they're, they're having this conversation. Maybe that's not as good for a bar conversation, but that's a better for a one-on-one like family member or friend, somebody that you're really close to. But at a bar, I would I'd probably keep it a little bit lighter and just, and just focus on asking questions, focus on the epistemology or how people know what they know, because that can spark really interesting discussions. Hmm. And also, I would just, just wanted to say one last thing, which is to show that you're that the, the person doing the engaging and asking the questions is willing to change their own mind. I think that's mm-hmm. really key. like, well, OK, if you actually have evidence for this position and, um, you know, I look at it and see it's reasonable, then I'm willing to change my mind and you want know, to offer that up or or even offer up when you have changed your mind in the, in the past. Like I used to believe this and then I found out this other fact and it changed my mind. So mm-hmm. modeling that is really important, too. Mm. It's hard to do. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. It requires some humility. I was surprised to hear you mention uh, that book, Nonviolent Communication. I've actually read it. I heard the, the Twitter CEO, Jack Dorsey, former CEO maybe, uh, recommend it. And it seems that the idea that 
like words as violence, communication as violence, um, would be counter to what I understand of, of your philosophy? How did, how did you rectify um, the ideas in that book? Uh, well, I don't remember in the book, I don't remember Marshall Rosenberg talking about words being violence. I don't think that, at least... Yes, yes. My... I, w- I wouldn't say that's his phrase, but I would oh. say that's, um, that's become a phrase that is now um, around you know, discussions on college campuses, things like that, um, you sure. know, shutting down of um, speakers or ideas that are not liked, that sort of thing. Right, right. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if, if in the more modern movement of nonviolent communication, if they're starting to use that language, is that what you mean? Or they're, you're just talking about the book separately from what's happening in college campuses and that sort of thing? Yes, I'm, I'm, I see them as separate things. And then I'm knowing you, though, I'm surprised that, um, that those would come together for you. And it, and it shows that distinction. And it shows how critically you are thinking that um, it doesn't just get lumped in with a set of ideas about um, progressive agendas on college campuses, but instead it's actually an idea that you can separate out and then use the, the framework and the tools from that book in your own pursuits. I really liked a lot of the fundamentals of the book, and um, certainly I don't think words are violence. I mean, words can be harmful, sure, um, but I'm a staunch free speech advocate, and I think that you know there are many people have written on the importance of free speech, everyone from John Stuart Mill to Jonathan Rauch's Kindly, Inquis- Kindly Inquisitors, which is really, really good. Highly recommend it to everyone. But yeah, there's clearly a difference between actual physical acts of violence, violence or force when you're physically harming someone or just disagreeing with them or even just saying something nasty. You know, um, Yes, that can have an effect, but the response to that shouldn't be. The reality is, is people just use that as a tool. They say, well, they've caused harm to me or someone I know, therefore I can use actual physical harm and justify that in my mind because words are violence. I mean, it's, it's just really a way to get around um, and, and to justify the use of force and violence, which I think is just morally reprehensible. So what would be the, the crafty way to, to point that out and to still create a situation where people could, could come together rather than feeling, um, you know, dunked on? How, how can you do that well? It's tricky, um, especially if somebody has, has been taught that at school and learned that from various media sources. But again, I, I would, I suppose, start with asking questions like, okay, can we distinct, distinguish between literal acts of physical violence of so somebody actually harming somebody versus somebody feeling emotionally upset because someone said something nasty to them? So that would be a good place to start. You know, is there a difference between those two things? Um, and it's, it's hard to gain that conversation out without having someone in the room with us who <laughs> could respond to me. Um, but that's, that's certainly a good place to start, I think. And uh, it's not a good idea to just ridic- ridicule that person or anything like that. Um, but asking those probing questions like, well, is there really a difference? And what is that difference? And how do we how do we resolve disputes without using physical violence? And what what should we do? You know, if someone is saying something nasty to us, like if people are using the N word, for instance, I mean, now pe- people get fired for using that in a particular context, like the guy at Netflix in saying that this is a word we don't want on our show. And then he got fired for, for even mentioning it. So it goes to, there, there's such a cultural stigma around using that word. And I think that's how those things should be handled. There should be, not that the, I'm not approving of the guy getting fired in that context because he didn't actually use it in a derogatory way. But um, there are instances like that where people just get shamed and then they just stop using those words. And then they stop using these phrases and these harmful terms because ultimately, as a society, we've determined, at least in the United States, that this isn't the kind of verbal behavior that we want to engage with or engage in. And so that that keeps the freedom of speech intact while also not resorting to physical threats or physical violence. You said that we don't have somebody here. Um, Do you want to role play? Sure. Okay. (laughs) Um, I'm not as skilled at this as you are. So maybe maybe you could take the lead a little bit, but uh, I can I could be the uh, the words or violence college junior, um, you know, resisting um, having some speaker come to campus or something like that. Sure, sure. So what would be your main claim that you'd want to put forth? Um, that this speaker has uh, has an agenda of ideas that uh, that hurt the the individuals who represent something different. Um, you know, let's say it's. Um, 
uh, let's say something about uh, women in uh, in the home versus the workplace. Mm. So, do you think that the this speaker is going to do actual harm to to women or other people by giving this conversation by having this talk? Yeah, I I think that uh, that it's gonna it's gonna hurt the young women at this university and that it's gonna set them up um, to. To, to have you know ideas that are really counter to what's best for them and that it's going to continue to put a, a ceiling over them. Interesting. I, I really like to give, I like to do my best to give people a certain kind of autonomy and assume that they can handle hearing ideas that they disagree with. That's what I, how I like to engage. So I'll often listen to people that I disagree with that might be saying something even bad about men but you know, maybe maybe it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. But I'm still interested to see what they have to say. And anything that they don't, that I don't agree with, and I just leave behind. Could we grant women that kind of autonomy and and freedom to choose to just ignore what the guy says, what this person says? But there are there are going to be messages, uh, there are going to be billboards and posters and things like that around that are going to perpetuate these ideas. It's it's going to just seep into the culture. If we if we let this person come here and speak, I feel like we have to keep them out. I see. Do you think that it's possible that they might actually say something that's useful and interesting to people, or do you think it would be completely all all bad? It could be useful. I could see that to to some people, maybe people who have um, who have similar desires, someone who agrees. Yeah, that makes sense. So, do, do you think we should? cancel this invitation for the speaker uh, just on behalf of some people who might not like what they have to say. And the follow up to that would be, um, there are a lot of people going around saying things I really don't like. Should I try to cancel them? Should I try to limit what other people can say just because I don't like it? Well, that would be maybe too much. But I think here, I mean, this is our university. We, we pay to be here. Uh, we live here. You know, it's, it's our home. Um, and so to, to let this into our space, um, this specific spot just seems like too much. Do you think you can just ignore it? I mean, do you, is it mandatory? Do you have to go to the talk? No, you don't have to go. It might, it might be good just to ignore it. I, I personally am worried about limiting or disinviting speakers who have been granted a chance to speak because of where that can lead, because it's possible that in the future, maybe your ideas are going to be deemed or my ideas are going to be deemed dangerous or harmful. And I wouldn't want some other governing body or group of students or anyone to shut me down or cancel me. So I guess that's the position I would take. I'd be worried that that might happen in the future to, to one of us, um, you know, when we might disagree, when people might disagree with what we have to say. That's pretty good, man. <laughs> <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so let's say, let's say, you know, somebody comes around on some sort of idea, you know, what can we do then to make sure that, um, that there's, there's also forgiveness, that that's a, that that's going to be a, a healing and connecting sort of, um, discussion, not just a right, wrong, change your mind. Totally. No, I think that's super important. Um, <clears throat> and what I'll say before getting to that is, Often in one conversation, people are not going to change their mind, um, and especially if there are other people listening. And this is why I advise not doing this online because you have an audience where people want to score points and everything. And but that happens in person too, especially if there's an audience, if you're at a bar or whatever. Um, so people want, will want to save face in front of other people, um, but they still might go home and think um, about one of the things that you said. And this is something Daryl talked a lot about when I was interviewing him when he's talking to KKK members. I don't think any of them immediately left the clan. You know, it was several conversations over months, if not years, of them of him planting a seed of doubt in their minds and them eventually um, realizing like, oh, well, what I believe really doesn't make any sense and it is hateful and ignorant. Um, so it, so, one, so the one encouragement that I would offer people is that even though it, seem, it can seem pointless because maybe the person didn't change their mind on the spot or even the second time you've talked to them, or they're just not willing to consider, or they don't seem to be willing to consider what you're saying, often those points, certain points will land with them and they'll reflect on them later. Or if there is an audience, other people will think about what you've said and maybe change their minds. 
Um, and the reason I bring that up is because a lot of people think that these interactions are pointless because people are so siloed in their, in their belief systems and they just don't even want to engage. So I'd encourage people to keep engaging regardless of how difficult it is. And then again, you know, uh, Daryl models that so well for us, this idea of forgiveness, he becomes friends with these people, right? I mean, he becomes friends with the people who hate him for no good reason at all. And, and he's ma maintained, you know, these friendships for years and, you know, he has family dinners with them and, you know, invites them to coffee. And so that, that level of, of acceptance and, um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty extreme example. We're talking about somebody in the KKK, but that it's, it's a pretty good example of, of someone, you know, being willing to forgive someone for hating them for no, for no, no good reason. And then actually being friends with that person. So Daryl's perfect at, at modeling that. And yeah, I think, you know, I, I, ideally you don't get to a place where it's so heated that things get out of control in the first place where you don't necessarily even need to forgive the person. But if there, if that does need to happen, I would say, you know, continue to be friends with them and continue to, to have those conversations and, um, you know, just don't, don't close them out of, out of your life, especially if they don't change their minds. I mean, you know, if they, if they still disagree with you on certain points, like, so what? <laughs> yeah. Well, Travis, for, for people who want to see more stuff like this, uh, before I ask my last question, where can people find you online? Yeah, so there's a few different places. If people want to learn a little bit more about When in Doubt, which is still in production, they can go to winindoubtfilm.com. Um, and then I've got a YouTube and a Locals page, and people can support my work on Locals uh, either through a monthly or yearly subscription, get access to exclusive content and interviews that I do there. Um, and the Locals is uh, it's for my other documentary series that we didn't really touch on, but it's thewokereformation.locals.com. And then on YouTube, um, if you look up the Signal Productions, that's the name of my production company that houses all, all of my projects. So if you look up the Signal Productions, then you'll, you'll find all my stuff. Great. We'll put links to all of that in the description for people to check it out. And Travis, my final question is, uh, you know, when the film comes out, what do you hope will happen? It's challenging, as I was saying before, to, to get these films out there and, and to get, you know, a wide audience. And that would be the first thing that I would hope would happen is that we get it into some, some theaters or at least on some big streaming platforms so that people can actually see it. And then the other would be to um, just spark some conversations between people, you know, um, and help people just reflect a little bit more on their own beliefs and their own approach to these conversations and... The, the ultimate goal that uh, sort of underlies pretty much all my work is to help people just be more reflective and a little less credulous and a little less dogmatic. So that's my ultimate goal. Thanks for watching this episode. To help get more great guests on the show, be sure to subscribe.